Chapter 28, Bali. Virgil tried once again to shove the toe of his sneaker between two of the heavy stones of the well, but they were so densely packed that he couldn't gain enough footing to step up and reach the ladder. He also tried the ledge again, but it wasn't tall enough. Neither was he. He jumped just in case he'd suddenly sprouted ten inches, but his fingertips never brushed the bottom rung. He wasn't even sure where the ladder was anyway. It was so dark. He sat, exhausted, and fed Gulliver a dandelion. I wonder how long it will take for someone to start searching for me, Virgil said. He thought about the stone boy. How do you know someone hasn't started already, said Ruby. I hope they show up before Pa comes back. Why don't you rest instead of worrying about Pa? He's not here now. That's what matters. I can't rest. It's too quiet, said Virgil. Hmm. Silence is good sometimes, Ruby replied. That's when you're able to hear best. Hear what? Your thoughts, Bayani. That's just it. I don't want to have any thoughts because then I'll have to think about how I'm trapped down here with no way out. Ruby sighed. That's the problem. People don't want to listen to their thoughts, so they fill the world with noise. I wouldn't mind the quiet if I were someplace else. Like where? Virgil brought his backpack closer. Bali. What's Bali? I don't know, said Virgil. It's a place people always want to go. His parents talked about it often. They even had brochures. Why? What's it look like? Magical, I think. Otherwise, they would. Otherwise, why would so many people want to go there? Virgil imagined a bright purple sky with thick blue clouds. Any time it rained in Bali, the clouds cracked open and fat drops of laughing gas fell down on everyone. No one could stop laughing in Bali. They drank out of golden goblets and laughed and laughed. They didn't care if people were in their shells or not, and the sun shone all the time, so the whole place was bathed in light. Anything the light touched belonged to the sun gods, and the sun gods never allowed any evil to pass through Bali's borders. There were soldiers stationed at every entrance, just in case, but no one dared to even step close. The sun gods' as only mortal enemies were the 100 kings of darkness, but the kings had been banished to the core of the earth, where they'd been asleep for 5,000 years. The 100 kings of darkness couldn't sleep forever. Everyone knew that, but no one knew when they'd wake up. So the sun gods appointed one special warrior to defeat them. The warrior spent years in training, so he'd be prepared if the kings ever opened their eyes, all 200 of them. It's you, Bayani, said Ruby. You're the sun god warrior. I'm no warrior, said Virgil. He leaned his head back against the stone and breathed in the mildew. He didn't notice it as much now. My brothers, maybe, but not me. Pshaw. What do you mean, pshaw? They're strong and everything. What's that got to do with anything? Well, I'm just saying, they aren't scrawny and weak like me. Weakness has nothing to do with how much you weigh. Ruby hesitated. Sure, maybe they can play sports and lift things, but that doesn't mean they're strong. There are many different ways to be strong, and being a warrior has nothing to do with size. Surely there have been small warriors before. Virgil thought of Polito in The Jungle Dragon, which had been one of Lola's favorite stories before she switched to tales about crocodiles and rocks eating children. The story of Polito had a much happier ending. Tell me about him, said Ruby. How do you know what I'm thinking? I was listening, but I didn't say anything. What difference does that make, Ruby said. Tell me the story. I love stories. Ruby didn't consider himself much of a storyteller, but he gathered all the pieces of Paulito together in his head and began the best way he knew how, at the beginning. Polito was only one inch tall, but he wanted to be king, not because he was greedy or anything like that, but because his village wouldn't stop arguing and fighting over petty nonsense. Virgil remembered Lola using that phrase specifically, petty nonsense, because he had asked her what it meant. When your house is on fire and you straighten the pillows before you leave, Lola had said. Everyone laughed at him. They said a man who was one inch tall could never rule a village. They got so worked up that they started arguing again. Gulliver chirped, so Virgil fed him a dandelion. He didn't feed him more than one at a time, though. 
Gulliver had to ration his food. Virgil wondered if he would have to eat dandelions too. What would happen if he did? Would he die of dandelion poisoning? And what about water? How long could he go without water? Virgil put his hand on his throat. Suddenly he was very thirsty. Then what happened, Barony? Ruby urged. I hope that's not the end. Oh, sorry. Virgil dropped his hand and scratched behind Oliver, Gulliver's ears. I'm not very good at telling stories. Not like Lola. Thinking of Lola made Virgil sick and nauseous. Like there were a million tears deep inside of him that wanted to come out. What would she be doing now? Folding laundry? Ironing shirts? Pulling weeds from the garden? Fussing at his mother for buying too many bananas? Whatever it was, she probably wasn't thinking that one of her stories had finally come true. A well had eaten her grandson. Just try, Ruby said. Virgil swallowed. While they argued, he gathered grains of sand from the beach. He could only carry a handful at a time. The village was so busy arguing that they didn't notice that what he was doing. Then, big ships came and tried to invade, but they couldn't get in because Palito had built a fortress one handful at a time. Ruby waited. Mm -hmm. And they crowned him king of the island. He was the best king they ever had. Those one million push-down tears crept upward. He missed his Lola. I'm no warrior. I'm no Paulito, he said. Paulito wouldn't hide from the bull. Paulito was brave. He wouldn't be scared. It's not being brave if you aren't scared. Yes, but I don't do anything. I don't fight at all. There are many ways to fight. Maybe you just haven't been ready. But you'll be ready next time. I don't want a next time. Dear Bayani, said Ruby, there is always a next time. Bayani meant hero, Virgil remembered now. He sat in the silence of the deep, dark well, suddenly remembering things. One thing he remembered was the day his parents and his math teacher told him he'd be going to the resource room every Thursday because of his multiplication tables. Virgil's mind had wandered that day as he sat in the uncomfortable chair across from Mr. Linton with his parents on either side of him. Instead of listening to the details of what made him special, he heard, multiplication tables, and, and began to imagine a never-ending assembly line of tables, like the kind you get at Ikea, cloning themselves and stacking up, up, up. And he pictured himself standing near the bottom one, leaning back and trying to see the top of the Ikea mountain, only he couldn't because he was special. Mr. Linton explained to Virgil and his parents that going to the resource room meant Virgil would get more individual attention. It didn't mean there was anything wrong with him, Mr. Linton hastened to add. At the time, Virgil had thought, that's not true. There is something wrong. I can't do my multiplication tables. There's a right way to do them, and there's a wrong way. And if I was doing them the right way, I wouldn't be here. But he kept his mouth shut. He didn't mind going to the resource room anyway. It's not like he was having a blast with Mr. Linton. So if he needed more individual time, that was fine with him. He was pretty sure no one would notice he was gone anyhow. Besides, it turned out to be the best day of Virgil's entire school year because that's where he saw Valencia for the first time. She was wearing a purple shirt. Her hair was in two perfect braids. The hems of her jeans were smudged with dirt, and she carried a journal under her arm that Virgil was desperate to read. Sometimes he'd wonder, if she accidentally left it behind on the desk, would he sneak a peek, or would he be a good person and guard it so no one else could? He liked to think it was the second one but he really longed to know what she wrote and sketched about. It made Virgil want his own journal. Maybe he had things to say, and he just didn't know it yet. I wish I had a journal now, he said to the darkness. I would write a goodbye letter to my family. Not that they would ever find it. You don't need paper to write a letter, said Ruby. You can write letters in your head. What do you mean? You close your eyes and mouth and send your thoughts through the universe. But how can my family get a thought? They'll feel it, even if they don't know it, said Ruby. Don't you ever just get a feeling sometimes? Yes. Like sometimes at school, he could feel the bull nearby, even though he couldn't see him. Same with Valencia. That's the universe sending you a letter, said Ruby. He thought of Lola and how she always seemed to know what he was feeling. Maybe, somehow, she would feel that he was in trouble now. I think Lola gets lots of letters, he said. We all do, Ruby replied. 
Some of us are just better at opening them.